Hi, this is Vera here. Uh, in this part of the tutorial, I will cover some high-level considerations for responsible AI, meaning to design AI systems that are ethical and minimizing potential harms. So REI is often operationalized through a few normative principles. For example, uh, this Berkman report mapped REI principles in many industry and government documents and summarized a few common themes. Among them, today I will focus on two that are commonly prioritized, which are fairness and explainability. So starting with fairness, I want to start with some common myth. So you may have heard about bias mitigation algorithm or some people call de-biasing algorithm. You may think that fairness is a technical problem. It is about improving the model and is a data scientist task. And here are my corrections. If anything you take away from this tutorial about fairness, I hope is the point that fairness is a socio-technical problem. Fairness work should ultimately focus on mitigating harms, meaning the human consequence instead of the model. And lastly, fairness must be informed by user research and requires design thinking, and ideally in collaboration with data scientists. So let's start with harms, the human consequences from biases. The research literature commonly differentiate two high-level categories. One is allocation harm, that a bias system may withhold opportunities, resource, or information for a certain group. Considering use cases such as automated system for hiring or lending. The other is representation harm, that reinforce subordination along the lines of identity, whether it is underrepresentation, stereotyping, or erasing a certain group, commonly appears in systems like search engines. Since this is a very short tutorial, I will only give a very high-level overview of fairness consideration, uh, the technical part of the problem. If you're interested in digging deeper, here is the list of other longer tutorials and videos to watch. So the fourth first point, which is the focus of lots of fairness research, is that there are many different notions of fairness. Let's take a hiring as a running example, where job applicants are assessed by an ML system. This is a context where allocation harms can have profound effects on people's life. At a high level, we may differentiate between individual fairness, that is applicants with the same inner background should be treated similarly, and group fairness, that the same group, for example, male and female applicants, should be treated similarly. Under group fairness, there are also many different ways to consider what fairness means. For example, you can require that the female and male group to have equal opportunity of getting a positive prediction from the model that is often called demographic parity. Or you may require the female and male groups to have equal opportunity of true positive, meaning the same level of correct prediction for those who are qualified for a job. This is called equal opportunity. And there are many more notions I will not cover today. It is important to keep in mind that these different notions of fairness cannot be achieved simultaneously. So this is called impossibility of fairness. So you will have to make a careful decision on which one to adopt for your specific context. It is also important to note that biases are not just embedded in the model. They can also emerge in the social components, such as how people interact with the system. For example, we must also consider how the male and the female applicants may have different patterns in clicking on and getting recommendations for different jobs. On the technical side, another focus is developing bias mitigation techniques. They can be applied to the data at a pre-processing stage, to the algorithm in processing while training a model, or to a trained model post-processing. I'll not discuss the details of this uh, technique, but if you're interested, besides the tutorial I mentioned earlier, also check out the many fairness toolkits available. They will make it much easier to implement these techniques. Again, I want to emphasize that fairness is a socio-technical issue, and these bias mitigation techniques represent only a small set of solutions. It is often more important to reflect on targeted root of inequality and injustice, such as improving job inventory, training, and culture. I want to end this part of presentation by highlighting why fairness is an HCI researcher and a UX practitioner job. Even if we just focus on the two points that there are many different fairness notions and mitigation approaches, the question is how to choose. 
The answer can never be automated, but requires a deep understanding of four specific system, who are the stakeholders, who can be harmed and how they can be harmed, what does an acceptable outcome look like, what trade-offs can be made, and also acknowledge that what can or cannot be anticipated at the moment. You can see that many of these questions are core to what UX research cares about through formative research, evaluative research, and continuous monitoring and iteration. Another point I want to briefly touch on is that mitigating harm is not just mitigating biases in the model, but can be achieved by many design solutions, such as providing transparency, supporting user agency, providing path for recourse, as well as auditing and contexting the AI. So this part of design-oriented harms mitigation strategy is still very much an open space for rich HCI research opportunities. If you're interested in thinking deeper on those questions, especially if you are practitioners interested in helping organizations approaching the fairness problem, I highly, highly recommend this resource called Fairness Checklist. So this checklist will guide you to understand fairness-related issues and consider possible mitigation strategy throughout all stages of AI product development. You can find the latest version online if you search for fairness checklist or read the original Kai paper from some of my MSR colleagues. Now let's turn to explainability. Again, I want to start with some common myth. First, uh, many assume that explainability is about disclosing the model process. And much work is around achieving this by developing new algorithms and technique. And the hope is we can come up with the best approaches. Instead, I want to highlight that explainability is a human-centered property. It is about enabling human understanding. And we cannot talk about understanding in a vacuum, but must be as means to an end to achieve some end goals. And because there are many different goals people seek explanations for, we must recognize that there are no one fix or solution. And also, explainability is concerned not just about technique to provide model explanation, but also good designs that present them in a human understandable fashion. I also do a very high level overview of the XAI techniques, again, with other tutorial listed to dig deeper. If you look at these hundreds, if not more, XAI techniques, they generally fall into two camps. One is to train a directly explainable model, some people call it glass box model, so they are relatively simple model that follow uh, intuitive process, right? They can be rule-based model, decision tree, linear regression. On the right side, we also have lots of algorithms to generate post hoc explanation. That is when you adopt a black box model that cannot be directly explained, such as a deep neural network or a large ensemble. You will have to use a separate algorithm to generate explanation. And this explanation generally takes three forms. To show you this explanation, I will adopt a running example. Consider a, a decision support ML system used by banks to predict the repaying risk of loan applicants. To highlight the point of no one fits all solution, uh, there are multiple kinds of stakeholders who demand explanation and for different purposes. So there's a data scientist who develops the model. They must um, one explanation to debug the model and verify uh, it is ready for deployment. There's a law officer who is the direct user of this tool, and they may want explanation to help them make the final judgment of whether to grant or not. There's also this bank customer right, who may want explanation to understand the results, especially when their loan uh, is rejected. So let's start with the first one, right? The global explanation to explain the model's overall logic. At a high level, uh, post hoc global explanation are often doing knowledge approximation. Since the complex blocks model is not directly understandable, the common approach is to train a much simpler model, such as a rule-based model, to approximate the decision of the complex model. For example, here, this rule-based model explained by saying, under these rules, the model would predict low risk. So the data scientists can look at this rule and get a sense if the model's logic is reasonable. If not, they can locate a problem and debug the model. The online officer can also look at a rule and develop trust if they see the 
this rule align with their own domain knowledge. If not, they may be able to learn when they need to be more cautious when working with this system. Now we have local explanation focusing on explaining a particular prediction or decision. And the most popular form is called feature importance. So in this fictional case, the model explained this particular prediction by showing that how each feature of this customer JSON contribute to the model's low risk prediction for JSON. And it highlights that the most important feature is JSON's asset score. Since it is high, it has a huge negative contribution to predicted risk. So that's why JSON is considered low risk. Lastly, we have a category explanation that allowing inspecting counterfactuals. Counterfactual means that when people have a prediction, but they're actually interested in counter to the facts, a different outcome, often the more desirable one. In the case of loan application, this is especially useful when a bank customer is rejected a loan and interested in the counterfactual question of a why not may not accept it and how can I improve to uh, change the prediction in the future? And a popular approach is called contrastive feature by suggesting what feature to change, often implying minimum change, can flip the prediction and get a desired class. So I hope this running example demonstrates that different kinds of explanation are required for different goals. And our consideration for best solution would explode if we combine these many goals with also different types of user, different domains, and different social contexts. So with this very complex design space, how do we choose from the many different XAI technique and ultimately how to create the right XAI design? One solution is we can have more user-centered design process to choose the right XAI solution specific to a system, even specific to interaction. At a high level, such a user-centered design process should start with understanding users' needs, not only what they want to be explained, but also articulate what are their end goal through this better understanding and the success criteria of this end goal. It's also necessary to understand the context and workflow that explanations should be situated. The second step should be choose the right access techniques based on these user needs. You could be a step in collaboration with data scientists who may bring to the table knowledge about the models and data. In this step, if you're a designer, it'd be helpful to obtain examples of explanation output from this algorithm to ground your design. It's also useful to understand what are the limitations of the chosen technique in order to communicate them to users or come up with design solutions to mitigate the risk. Once the techniques are chosen, we can create design that present their output. It is important to evaluate the design by whether they can help user achieve the end goal identified in the first step and iteratively improve the design. Important design consideration include what's the right modality to present the explanation and how granular the information should be. And another rule of thumb is that you should provide useful information, but do not overwhelm the user, which often requires integrating the appearance and content explanation in the overall user experience. Often you might also need to look beyond just the output of the XAI technique, but consider what else the user need to achieve their end goal whether it is additional info, such as what a model feature means in this domain, or additional system features. Here, we also do a shameless plug of our own work on such a user-centered design process. We call it question-driven XAI design. A core cool idea here is to ground user needs for explainability in what kind of questions they ask to understand the AI. So in the first step, you can understand user needs concretely by what kind of questions they ask. In this paper I listed, we also provide a question bank as a reference for common questions users ask for AI system, and also a mapping guide between this question and a popular XAI technique, which can support this collaborative technical choice with data scientists. I hope you will find them useful. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and this is the end of my part of tutorial. Thank you.